Okay, but what about um, Planet X? Oh, it's a reality. Yeah? Yeah. So what are they going to do about that? Well, apparently they are concerned about... <clears throat> you know the story. According to Sitchin and according to the Sumerians, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. Well, our astronomers apparently have concluded that it is indeed a reality. For almost a century, astronomers have been concerned and interested about what they called an intruder that seems to come and go from time to time. And they can, they can measure it by the perturbations and the effects on other planets. <clears throat> They've known its existence for a long time. Mm -hmm. But they've never gone public about it. Well, in the early 80s, the JPL, the guy, guys at Joint Pro Jet Propulsion, Jet Propulsion Lab. used to call it uh, Jack Parsons Laboratory. Yes. Which I think is probably where the original JPL came from. Yes. Because Jack Parsons established it. Anyhow, they, they sent out a couple of pioneers, satellites, back in 82, just to try to determine if there was some truth to it. Mm -hmm. And the pioneers apparently came back with data which said not only yes, but hell yes. <laughs> and the pioneers concluded, the pioneer satellite data concluded. So, wow, astronomers were troubled by that. Whew. Could this thing be real? And well, what did they did? They uh, they sent out what they called an infrared astronomical satellite. I think they called it IRAS. Anyhow, and this was done in '83. <clears throat> they sent the IRAS out, taking infrared pictures <clears throat> all around the ecliptic, above and below. And apparently, IRAS got two giant positive responses that yes, the, the twelfth planet, the tenth planet, however you want to call it, yes, it's real. And that's when the, the lid slams down. So it's <clears throat> out there, it's on its way back in, right? According to the Sumerians and Sitchin, apparently it is. <clears throat> and uh, if you're a student of history, as I one of my majors. Its last pass was 1600 BC. The Sumerians and Sitchin and all of those say it has an orbit of 3600 years. Mm -hmm. So as like many of us, you know, I count on my fingers and toes and figure out, well, 1600 BC, it has an orbit of 3600 years. Wow! It's due. Well, apparently it is. So now, why are they keeping this a secret? Because you're an expert on secrets. Listen, every time Nibiru would make a pass, it was not always devastating. Mm -hmm. It would depend on whether the planet Earth and Nibiru were on the same side of the sun at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if we were on the same side of the sun at the same time, all hell would break loose on planet Earth. Well, apparently, last pass triggered the explosion of Santorini, Terra, the volcano in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean Sea, blew its top, brought to a close the great, great Minoan civilization, among other things. It affected Egypt. It's all in the records, apparently. There are even historians and theologians who say that Santorini's explosion is exactly what you're reading about when the plagues and all hit Egypt that allowed Moses to get the Israelites out. But if you look at 1600 BC and figure that was a relatively recent past, it's due now, and apparently the guys in the astronomical observatories know it. And that, again, is above top secret. Let me give you a tiny example. For a number of years ago, there were two brilliant guys working at the Naval Observatory in Washington. Uh, Tom Van Flandern is one who I hope you've interviewed. No, but um, <clears throat> yeah, please continue, and we'd love to do He's that. He's no longer with the uh, Naval Observatory. 
The other one was the chief astronomer at the observatory, a brilliant man by the name of Robert Harrington. Right. And Harrington gave an interview to Zechariah Sitchin a number of years ago. I think it was 91 or so. Mm -hmm. Where he came right out and said, Dr. Sitchin, we, we are interested in this because it ties in perfectly with the work you've done on the Sumerians and the ancient planet Nibiru. He said, we found it. It's real. We have photographs of it. And he says, from what we can put together, it, it's a rather nice planet. <clears throat> it's about two and a half times the size of the Earth. Apparently, it's uh, heading toward the system, the center of the system. <clears throat> we, uh, we've concluded about everything about it, except that we haven't named it. And Zechariah spoke up and he says, it's already been named. He says, you simply call it Nibiru, as the Sumerians called it, the planet of the crossing. Mm -hmm. Well, Mrs. Sitchin and I were in agreement I, I miss her. She died about a year ago. Mm. <clears throat> she was convinced that Robert Harrington had died because somebody bumped him off because he had the courage to come out and give Zechariah this interview. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. It's on tape. No, I <clears throat> haven't seen it, but we interviewed uh, Lucas <clears throat> Scantamberlo about this subject, mm. and, and he's also talked about Robert Harrington. Yeah, he, well, Harrington gave the interview to Zechariah, and it's on a, a video called Are We Alone? Mm. And I think you can pick it up at the conference here next week. Okay. I have a copy, and I sent a copy to uh, Neil, Neil Freer, who's a man you should interview. Okay, well, we're in touch with Neil. He's a very interesting guy. <coughs> oh, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant guy. He's brilliant. He... Uh, he just recently came out and admitted that he's had a, an intimate interrelationship with extraterrestrial intelligence since he was a child. Well, he's always talking about the Anunnaki. I do know this. Well, he, he wrote a book called Breaking the God Spell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he, he has supported Zachariah's work for years. I have a question, Bob, if I, uh, if I may, about the provenance of this information in the sense that Zachariah Sitchin's work is very well documented, and a lot of people watching this video will be very familiar with, with his books and with um, all the intelligent commentary about that. Are you saying that you have additional information based on your contacts within the Old Boys Network, or are you doing a neat presentation? Of Many of my conclusions are my own. You know, and they, in many respects, correlate perfectly with Sitchin's work, <clears throat> which is, you know, Neil has told me, he says, you know, Zachariah really should get the Nobel Prize, mm. but I don't know what they would grant it to him in what field. But he's such an outstanding scholar in what he's done, and his, the Earth Chronicles is what he calls all of his work. Well, I think there's seven or eight of them now. I have two questions. One's a minor one to do with celestial mechanics. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I've never understood and I've heard this from I've heard this question from many other people as well. That if Nibiru comes from the outer reaches of the solar system, it's gonna be an icy rock, which isn't gonna be the kind of place that any beings could live on or would want to live on. And Researcher Andy Lloyd, who you probably have heard about, has theorized that what they're seeing in the photographs that you refer to as an orange object is actually a brown dwarf with the possibility of Nibiru being one of its moons, if you like. And there's a lot of debate about how to apply what Sitchin seems to have been saying to the real practicalities of life on an icy rock out in the orbit of Pluto. And I wondered if you knew or had anything to say about that. No, it's not an icy rock. <clears throat> and yes, when it makes its long journey out and back, it gets so far away from the sun that the sun is probably no more than a little tiny prick of light, a little tiny pinpoint. 
And if you, you would think that it would be naturally icy cold. No, it, it, apparently the planet, like many planets in the system here, generate its own heat. It has in its core a generating heat system very much like our own. We have a system within the core of this planet that is a that has been described as a thermonuclear reaction, very similar to the sun. Now, most of the life and all of the bounty and all of the beauty of life on this planet comes from our going around this beautiful sun. But uh, I don't think Nibiru is a icy rock. No, I. I think, first of all, that it probably generates enough of its own heat, and I think they probably did indeed uh, create for themselves, with the advanced technology that they have, uh, a, a kind of a Dyson sphere. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. You know what brilliant British astronomer, I think, Freeman Dyson, said some years ago, that an incredibly advanced technology will have the ability to enclose its planet and retain not only its heat but its atmosphere. And I suspect that the Anunnaki have done that to Nibiru and they probably did it good enough, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million years ago. So the, the planet, I think the, the color from it, the the dull red golden color is a result of that envelope of of gold shell that they've created, they've created for themselves a Dyson sphere around their planet. And I suspect that any advanced technology will ultimately do the same, simply because it makes sense. It's a practical thing. But, but if they had that degree of engineering capability, why wouldn't they just live on Mars instead of Hurtling through the solar system. Well, they weren't the original occupants of Mars. Okay. They used Mars as a way station, and they've reactivated it. And I agree with Zachariah on that, that they've reactivated their way system, their way station there. They used to drop off on Mars on their way here. <clears throat> so they were never, I don't think, original inhabitants of Mars. No, no, I uh, the, there, there are a few remnants of original inhabitants on Mars. There's even some indications which I've been looking into and I've gotten some data <clears throat> that uh, we're playing host to a bunch of Martians here on this planet. Mm. <clears throat>